For a case of cough, using our mnemonic old car to sour guide, we note the onset or when did it start. For duration, we want to know are we coughing constantly throughout the day or is it more intermittent with certain activities such as lying down, as we'll see below in gastroesophageal reflux disease or congestive heart failure. If it is intermittent, we'd like to note the frequency. How long do you cough for and how many episodes of cough are you having per day or per week? And finally, we can note the progression. Does the cough appear to be occurring more frequently? Or if there is no progression, we can include it for our patient note, no progression. To characterize any bodily fluid, such as a cough, for our note, we want to write down the ABCs, or the amount, any blood, and the color. We could ask now, since this is a pulmonology case, or later in our review of symptoms, of any upper or lower respiratory tract symptoms, such as a runny nose, sore throat, or shortness of breath any aggravating and alleviating factors, and treatments tried. We'll divide our case of cough into dry versus wet. Dry being no or clear sputum, and wet having a white or productive sputum, or with hemoptysis. For all cases, we should order a CBC, serum electrolytes, and a chest x-ray. For a productive cough, we'll add in a sputum gram stain and culture. In ACE inhibitor, our supporting points will include a dry cough with a history of an ACE inhibitor use. In gastroesophageal reflux disease, we'll see a dry cough with dyspepsia, which can be broken down into heartburn or an epigastric burning, early satiety or fullness, and nausea. It can be aggravated by meals, lying down, or at night, and alleviated by antiacids or sitting up. We'll add in an H. pylori test and an endoscopy. In congestive heart failure, we'll see a dry cough that can be aggravated lying down or orthopnea, or at night, nocturnal dyspnea. Our patient can have a history of hypertension, diabetes, or an MI. We'll include a BMP, EKG, and echocardiogram. In pneumoconiosis, we'll see a dry cough with dyspnea or shortness of breath and a history of an occupational exposure, such as a minor. We'll include a CT chest. In asthma, we'll see a dry cough that can be aggravated at night because there is a circadian pattern to lung function or in the cold air. And we could have a history of triggers, such as allergens, either mold or dust mites, or a recent URI. We'll order a peak expiratory flow. And the treatment for an asthma flare are steroids. In upper airway cough syndrome, also formerly known as post-nasal drip syndrome, which also happens to include allergic and non-allergic rhinitis, we can see a dry cough with a runny nose. And again, using our mnemonic A, B, and C, we want to write down for our patient note the amount if there's any blood and the color. Sneezing, nasal itching, and the sensation of post-nasal drip or liquid dripping in the back of the throat will include a respiratory viral panel. In a post-infectious or URI-associated cough, we can see a dry cough with a history of a recent URI, such as a runny nose, sinus pressure, or sore throat. In an atypical pneumonia, we could see a dry cough with the onset tends to be a little more gradual and a concurrent or a history of a URI, such as a runny nose, sore throat, and if we see a fever, it tends to be low grade. We'll add to our workup a mycoplasma, chlamydia, and Legionella PCR. In an upper respiratory infection, and it's important and best practice to write out the full name of the disease state, which includes a common cold, sinusitis, and pharyngitis, we can see a cough or a runny nose. And again, we'll be sure to include the A, B, and Cs, sinus pressure, a sore throat, and a history of sick contacts. We'll order a respiratory viral panel. In an acute bronchitis, which is a lower respiratory tract pathology and not a pneumonia, we'll see a cough that's typically defined greater than five days. We can see purulent sputum, which is due to the epithelial lining sloughing off, and we can also see hemoptysis, which is due to the superficial vessels being damaged, and we can have a history of a recent URI serving as sinitis for the bronchial infection, and we'll order a respiratory viral panel. In pneumonia, we'll see a productive cough with dyspnea or shortness of breath and a runny nose, and we'll be sure to include for our note the A, B, and Cs. And we could have now a new onset fever. And as we'll see in our physical exam coming up, the positive special tests of tactile frematis and eophony. In bronchiectasis, we can have a productive cough with a history of recurrent pneumonias or cystic fibrosis. We'll order immunoglobin levels, a sweat chloride test, and a CT of the chest. 
in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which includes both chronic bronchitis and emphysema, we can have COPD as a new diagnosis, or if our patient was previously diagnosed, our diagnosis will be a COPD exacerbation. In either cases, we can have a productive cough or dyspnea. They will both be increased from baseline in the case of a COPD exacerbation. The productive cough in chronic bronchitis is typically defined for greater than three months for two years. Our patient will also be a smoker and greater than 50 years old. We'll order a pulmonary function test. And the treatment for a COPD exacerbation includes the administration of antibiotics, such as a ZPAC. In lung cancer, our supporting points will include a productive cough, hemoptysis, and the characteristic signs for cancer, which include weight loss or decrease in appetite. Our patient will also typically be a smoker, greater than 50 years old, with also a positive family history. And we'll order a CT chest, bronchoscopy, and lung biopsy. In pulmonary TB, we'll see a productive cough with hemoptysis, now night sweats, weight loss, fever, and a history of travel, such as to Africa, or an occupational exposure, such as working as a doctor. And we'll order a sputum acid fast smear and a PPD. And finally, in a pulmonary embolism, we'll see hemoptysis with pleuritic chest pain, calf pain, and a history of oral contraceptives or immobilization, such as after a recent surgery. And as we'll see in our physical exam, a positive Hammond sign. We'll order a D-dimer and CT angiography. So we're going to demonstrate a patient who is persistently coughing. You should keep your eye out for you know, a few things. Number one, a patient who is coughing, try and look into their hands. See if they're holding a little, you know, um, cloth or something. If they are holding a cloth, like a white cloth or something in their hand, ask to see it. A lot of times they would not tell you they're coughing out blood. But you see it, you can see it's painted. If you see the cloth in their hand, you can see it's painted red. Then you know that, yes, this patient probably has hemoptysis. Or you could see colored, um, you know, sputum. Of course, it's not going to be real sputum. It probably be colored green or yellow. And you know that, yes, they're having productive cough, productive, or productive of green or yellow sputum. That's how to tell. But then if you're talking to a patient, a patient keeps coughing. So, we say, how long have you had this? <coughs> I'm so sorry. I can't even <coughs> Is it okay if I get you a glass of water? <coughs> yeah. So, please. Now, in your room, it's not going to be a bottle of water. There's a tap. The tap has drinkable water. And there's, there are cups. You can quickly get a cup of water from the tap and hand to a patient. The patient drinks and gets better. So that's how you deal with a coughing patient. Right, we'll start the poem exam with hand sanitizer and we want to ask our SP if we have our permission to examine you. Okay, after he said yes, we'll start with the hint exam. For the eyes, we're primarily concerned for conjunctivitis for URI, so we'll ask the patient to look up. So we verbalize there's no conjunctivitis, no parlor, ask him to look down and verbalize no scleral icterus, no conjunctivitis as well. And then we could also quickly assess the nose to see if there's any rhinorrhea, if he has any runny nose or, con or congestion, and you know, we don't see and then we could go ahead and look into his oral pharynx. So we could do that with a tongue depressor. And we want to uh, use very light pressure for these SPs. We don't want to uh, cause them any pain. So ask them to stick out their tongue and say, ah. And we'll look around and say that there's no visible lesions. Uh, the oral pharynx is just clear of exudate. Onto lymphadenopathy. So we're going to go ahead and inspect his cervical lymphadenopathy. So we'll start over here. Next, we're going to go ahead and do submandibular, submental. Okay, we're going to do preauricular and postauricular. Do occipital. And we want to do supraclavicular. So please shrug your shoulders. Okay, good. Okay, so we had no lymphadenopathy. We'll go ahead and look at his fingernails, and you don't see any cyanosis. And we could press on his fingers, and we don't see any delayed cap refill. We also want to check for uh, calf tenderness if we were concerned about a PE. So we could squeeze his calves and ask him if he has any pain. Okay, and we're going to introduce the Hammond's maneuver. So it's when you ask him to dorsiflex, please. Please uh, raise up, uh, raise up your That's toes, right. okay. and then we'll squeeze their calf, and we'll ask them if they have any pain. Please raise up your toes again, and then do you have any pain on your calf? Okay. And now once we're we finished down there, it's always a good idea to hand sanitize again. So now we can move on to the palm exam. And so for the palm exam, the best way to do this is to drop down the gown halfway and ask the patient to please uh, sit cross, cross your arms here, and this will hold the gown and keep them uh, protected. 
So the first thing we want to do is uh, verbalize that there's no visible lesions to the anterior chest, to the posterior chest. Next, we'll palpate. So we'll palpate his chest and just ask him if you have any tenderness there or pain. Tenderness or pain. Do the same thing on the back. We could percuss. So we're going to go left to right. Three spots. Listen to his uh, lung fields. We'll use the bell with a stethoscope for his above the clavicle. So we'll instruct you on instruct them every time you feel the stethoscope. Please take a breath in and out. Okay, that was a good equal breath. Now on the other side. So please breathe in and out. And you'll notice here that this time you don't notice a breath coming in and out of him. Instead, you'll just notice a uh, arm shrug. So please do that again. You can see it again over there. So as we Move on to the diaphragm now for his lower lung fields. Please. Okay. And again, we don't hear a breath, and instead we see the sh arm shrug. I'll go ahead and do that for the last lung field. Please. Okay. Good. So that was a good breath. And then we see the same thing as well. And now on the posterior side, we'll do the same thing. We'll listen in three spots, comparing left to right. So please. You see the arm move up and down again, and we don't hear a breath. On the right side, we hear a breath. The left. see the arm move. Okay. So now that we completed the uh, auscultation part, and we can make a comment that we heard clear breast sounds on the right, but on the left, we didn't hear the breast sounds. We want to go to tactile fremitus. And so the way to do tactile fremitus is to so position your arms, your fingers around his uh, scapula and ask him to please say 99. 99. 99. And you could, if you could hear him, it's a little Horse. So that indicates that there's increased tactile fremitus. And now we're going to demonstrate egophony. So for egophony, you could use the diaphragm of the stethoscope. And you'll ask him to please say E. e. Okay, so we heard a clear E there. E. And now we could hear a transition to an A on the left side. We'll do the same thing for the lower lung fields. You hear a good E, e. and an A. E. E. Okay, good. While we have him sitting up here, we want to use economy and movement to make use of the time and listen to his heart sounds. This is the mnemonic we're going to use is apartment M225A. So we'll start off with his aortic in the second intercostal space on the right. Go ahead to this pulmonic, tricuspid, and mitral. And if this was a female patient, you could ask them to please lift up your left breast. comment that we heard an audible S1, S2, no audible S3s or S4s or murmurs or S and gallops. Okay. Now, if this was a case where we were concerned about mono in a poem case, this would be a good time to do the abdominal exam because we finished his, his upper chest. We could lie them down. So is it okay if I lie you down? Is it okay, good. Okay. You ask them their permission. You don't want to forget to extend the, uh, the leg rest. Start the same way. We'll verbalize that we don't see any visible lesions, and we'll go ahead and progress to auscultation. So for the abdominal exam, we want to auscultate first in four quadrants. Okay, now we could verbalize that we heard uh, normal active bowel sounds, and then we'll go ahead and percuss in the four quadrants. Okay, and uh, we want to ask them if they have any pain first. You want to avoid those areas. So do you have any pain anywhere? No. Okay, so we'll start in the lower quadrant here, and we'll do superficial first just with one hand. We could make good eye contact with the, with the SP to see if they have any, any pain or if they wince. Not painful at all? Okay, now we'll do, go ahead and do deep, and for that we could just single. We're going to put one hand on top of the other. Any pain at all? Okay, so no pain. And then to conclude, if we were concerned about mono, we want to check hepatomegaly or splenomegaly. So we want to place our hand under his his liver. You can instruct them to please take a deep breath in. And now, as he breathes out, you don't want to feel anything, any liver border below the the rib cage. So once you feel the rib cage, and no nothing extending further. You can make the comment that there's no hepatomegaly, and you could do the same thing on the swing side. So you could please take a deep breath in. Okay. And now breathe out. 
and then you can feel the lower border of the left rib cage and no organ extending below it. Okay, so now you can cover them up again. And then you want to help them sit up. And then just ask them if they have any questions. And then that will conclude the exam.